If you're not familiar with Hadrian's Villa, to call it a villa is somewhat misleading. The huge archaeological site is located about 15 miles from Rome, Italy, and was constructed as the private retreat of the Emperor Hadrian, who ruled from 117 to 138. I've been trying to reignite the motivation to finish my dissertation lately, so I decided to make a video applying 3D Gaussian splatting to old photogrammetry data. I'll also try to talk both about the archaeological background as well as the technology and the processing, since folks have requested that on previous videos. As always, if you have any questions or suggestions, leave a comment on the video or feel free to email me. I really enjoy hearing from people, and everyone's suggestions and complaints on previous videos have helped a ton. We're looking at a 3D Gaussian splat point cloud of Italo Gismondi's plaster model of Hadrian's Villa. Gismondi is best known for his plaster model of the city of Rome, called Il Plastico, and begun on Mussolini's orders in 1935, but his model of Hadrian's Villa is remarkable as well. It's worth mentioning that this is a large-scale physical model that illustrates Gismondi's hypothetical reconstruction of the ruins just outside, and this highlights one of the powerful applications of 3D models, both digital and physical, which is that models can make an incomplete or befuddling reality intelligible when we can view it in a single glance. This is particularly apparent when talking about archaeological ruins such as Hadrian's Villa, where often all that is visible of the ancient structures is crumbling walls. Gismondi was an archaeologist, and his reconstruction of the sprawling grounds of Hadrian's Villa is quite accurate based on the archaeological evidence. Of course, Due to the relatively small scale of the reconstruction, the fine details of the many colored marbles covering the interior walls and floors, the myriad sculpture and carved ornamentation, and the elaborate gardens and plantings embellishing courtyards and vistas is not represented here. If you'd like to see a digital reconstruction of the villa, check out the link to the Digital Hadrian's Villa project, which I worked on from 2010 to 2015. What we're looking at now is one of my favorite parts of the villa the Rocca Bruna and the Academia Esplanade. Of course, these are modern names given to the ancient structures, and in many cases we have no idea what purposes these buildings were used for in the time of Hadrian. The theater structure at the far end of the model is the subject of my dissertation, but more on that later. Every time I visit Hadrian's Villa, it always strikes me what a great idea it is to have this scale model available just before visitors enter the ruins. As we zoom out to see the full extent of the villa, its enormous scale becomes apparent. Gismondi's model is a huge aid in both imagining what the villa once looked like, as well as situating ourselves within it. Let's take a look at what the archaeological site of Hadrian's Villa looks like today. Right now the camera is moving over what was likely the ancient entrance to the villa. On the left is the Cento Camarelle, or the Hundred Chambers, which probably housed the many servants and slaves required to run and maintain the villa. All of those doorways in the brick would have opened onto wooden walkways. The entrance road runs alongside the so-called Antinoeon, excavated relatively recently and believed to be a shrine to Hadrian's lover Antinous, who died by drowning in the Nile River. Though the ruins are relatively well preserved, we can see, for example, the still standing vaults and domes of the large and small bath structures. We're still benefiting from the bird's eye view that a 3D digital model affords us. Now we're moving over the so-called Stadium Garden, which is neither a stadium nor a garden, but was named as such because of the shape of the ruins. It is the long rectangular space at the center of the screen, with a curved end on the left. At center is the building of the three exedrae, which does in fact have three exedrae, or porticos. As I mentioned, we have very little idea what the ancient uses of many of these buildings were, except, of course, in the case of bathing structures, dining halls, and theaters, which follow specific architectural conventions found elsewhere in the Roman Empire. This flyover has really only shown us a small central part of the villa. The fact that it is possible at all is remarkable, as I was able to cobble together aerial imagery I found online to render this video of a Gaussian splat point cloud. Let's zoom in and take a detailed look at a building called the Hall of the Doric Pillars. We'll also look at a 3D Gaussian splat point cloud that's based on photographs I took in 2012. The camera path here gives you an idea of what the ruins are like to walk around. It's roughly aligned with the physical positions where I captured imagery. Because the quality of the Gaussian splatting relies on viewing angle, 
If the virtual camera strays too far from the points where photographs were taken in reality, the splats become sparse and blurry. You'll notice that happen a few times. This structure's imaginative name is the Hall of the Doric Pillars, and that refers to these white marble piers in the Doric order. Unlike columns, which are typically cylindrical, these plasters are rectangles, but still follow the Doric conventions of a fluted shaft and entablature with triglyphs and metopes above a relatively simple capital. The most famous example of Doric architecture is the Parthenon in Athens. In Hadrian's time, this hall would have been ringed by Doric piers supporting a masonry vault, and we can see the evidence of the missing pilasters in their bases around the edge. Today, only this corner still stands, bolstered by restoration work visible on the pilaster shafts. Gismondi shows the hall being fully enclosed, which has drawn some skepticism due to the immense open area in the center, which would have required substantial wooden beams to span. Nevertheless, the lack of gutters for rain and the ornate cut marble paving do seem to indicate an interior space rather than an open air courtyard. Let's bring up the photogrammetry project. This point cloud we're looking at now is the basis of the Gaussian splat visualization you just saw. All of these points are the photogrammetry tie points, or common points between images. They're essentially common features shared by multiple photographs. Now, whereas 3D Gaussian splatting gives you a radiance field visualization of a point cloud with the splats derived from the imagery, photogrammetry allows you to create a surface mesh based on depth maps and diffuse texture derived from the photographs. I process this at high quality, and the resulting mesh is 43 million polygons, which is far too high for real-time visualization in Unity, but is perfect for inspecting minute details. Let's zoom in and look at these Doric plaster bases, for example. With this photogrammetry model, I can take measurements or derive the profile of this and use it as the basis for a reconstruction, a 3D print, or even milling a replica out of marble. However, if we zoom back out, we notice that we're missing a lot of the background detail, the unbounded scenery that we could see in the Gaussian splat video, particularly here at the entrance to the Hall of the Doric Piers. When it comes to actually analyzing a space versus generating new visualizations of it, I much prefer using a surface mesh over a Gaussian splat point cloud. Let's turn the vertex coloring off and look at just the surface. Now you may remember that Gizmondi shows the Doric piers as being completely roofed in his reconstruction. If we zoom out and look at the locations of the pilaster bases, this is quite a large span that would need to be roofed. It's about 50 feet or 15 meters. Now the argument for this space being fully covered is that there are no gutters or drains at the edge of the space to channel away rainwater and that the paving is this very expensive cut marble or opus sectile pattern made up of gray marble squares separated by a thin yellow marble edge. If we look at the rather delicate vault above these pilasters, I don't see much evidence of a substantial superstructure there that would have supported the massive wooden roof it would take to enclose this space. The amazing thing about 3D digital models is that it allows one to pose, work through, and potentially solve questions like these without ever having access to the real artifact. In other words, I'm able to do this all digitally from thousands of miles away from Hadrian's Villa. That's all for now, but if you enjoyed this video, let me know in the comments or subscribe for more. See you next time.